we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 this morning. Uh, technically, the, the thought that Paul is starting to share begins in verse 23 of chapter 1, so I'm going to start reading there in just a moment. But just to recap where we are in 2 Corinthians, this is actually, uh, as my understanding, Paul's, te technically it's his third letter to them, uh, but no one knows what, where the other one is. It, uh, uh, the Lord didn't preserve it uh, for whatever reason, that's his, uh, that's his business. But um, the first letter that we read dealt with many problems that were that the church of Corinth was having. They they were cliquish. Uh, they were competing with each other as far as who it was that they followed. Uh, there were issues with the Lord's Supper. There were there was uh, they were leaving one another out and uh, uh, shaming those that were unfortunate and poor. And they were also abusing the gifts that God had given them, the spiritual gifts, so that it ended up being uh, 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 some sort of a popularity contest to see who could speak the loudest and the most often in tongues, and um, which we talked about uh, that back when we were studying it, but we don't need to rehash it now. But um, mm -hmm. there was all these problems in that church. Well, Paul wrote this letter, and... Uh, he uh, also visited them again uh, prior, I mean, after that first letter, and um, it must have been a short visit. He didn't get to spend a lot of time with them. But in this letter, Paul wants to encourage them. There are some issues. It would seem that they were taking issue with the fact that Paul had told them he would come again, and he hadn't yet. Uh, and so Paul spent some time trying to defend himself and what was going on in his life. But that's also part of the instruction here, is that oftentimes we criticize other people and what they're doing without really knowing or understanding what it is that's going on in their life, like they were doing with Paul. So Paul has to write them back and tell them, look, I was going through some terrible trials, and I was uh, pressed beyond measure. I was under so much pressure, I don't think there's a way you could possibly measure it. And uh, he tells them that they even despaired of their very life they even wondered if they were going to die uh, from the things that were happening to them. And if we can look through the book of Acts and we can learn many of these things and uh, that were happening with them, but not all, not everything is recorded. But Paul is in the first chapter trying to tell them that he wants to comfort them and that by their being comforted, he's comforted. But he identifies God as the God of all comfort. So Paul doesn't mean to suggest when he speaks of God in this way, that there's going to be an absence of trial. So there's going to be an absence of hardship. But God is still the God of comfort even when there are trials. And we talked a little bit about last week about part of the problem that we have with when we lack, when we're not comforted of God, is we're not looking in the right place. It just occurred to me this morning, and I know I'm not trying to reteach chapter 1, but uh, it occurred to me that, that what, what Paul says to the church at Philippi, and uh, I don't remember it verbatim, but he says, uh, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are good, and he goes on and think, naming things like that and says, think on these things. Well, he just got through saying the peace that passes all understanding uh, should be in your life or overcome you or, or it, it should definitely be present as a believer. But many times it isn't. It's because, I mean, why did Paul say that, to think on these things? It's because we, we're, we rarely do. We're, and if you watch the news today, man, it is really hard to think on the things that are pure and the things that are good and the things that are honorable and things are, that, that's going right when you're bombarded with everything that's wrong. But we have a tendency to do that. We have a tendency to look at all the things that are going wrong and we lack that peace and we lack that comfort because our vision is obscured by all the junk that we've stacked up in front of our face. And, um, but God wants us to be, com be comforted. He wants us to have peace in spite of those things that are happening around us, just as he did with Paul. Um, Paul, uh, and, and then in this chapter, we're going to start reading in 
Verse 23, however, so we get the complete thought. He says, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you uh, I came not as yet unto Corinth. Uh, not for that we have, uh, excuse me, I'm getting tongue tied. Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are help, help, helpers of your joy, for by faith you stand. So he, he starts this thought by telling them, I want you to know that I didn't neglect to come to you for any bad or nefarious reasons. It was because I wanted to spare you. And he goes on to say, but I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. So Paul didn't want to come to him with a heavy hand again. He had already done that. He had already sent them a letter, the first letter we read, and he had already come to them uh, in person to try to tend to these matters and try to help them to straighten things out. But he says, uh, For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad? But the same which is made sorry by me. And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye should might know the love which I have more abundantly with you. He wants to show them and, and, uh, and assure them that when he wrote to them, Oh, excuse me, when he didn't want to come to them, it's because he had already wrote to them, he had already come down on them. He didn't want to add to that sorrow. He wanted to give them space to get things straightened out so that when he came, he could come and he could be a, a joy and he could be a comfort to them in that way. Uh, and he wants them to know that he didn't write that first letter easily, that it was with much affliction and anguish uh, and tears that he wrote that letter. He's not trying to make them feel bad, he says. I'm not trying to grieve you or make you feel bad, but I want you to know that I wrote the whole thing in love. There was, there was nothing, uh, nothing but love uh, uh, was motivated in that letter. And he goes on to say, but, but if uh, any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, uh, that I may not overcharge you all. And so his purpose was, when he didn't come to them, when he said initially, uh, he wasn't sure that they had got their things straightened out, and uh, he would rather stay away, give them space, because he didn't want to come to them with the heavy hand of correction. And that's what he means by overcharging. He didn't want to come to them like a, uh, like a bull ready to, uh, you know, ready to uh, uh, tear some things up and, and uh, Dose some things down. He wanted to come there with the intent to, to build everyone up. And um, so that was one reason why he um, delayed coming to them. And like I said earlier, uh, it, it wasn't just that, but oftentimes we jump conclu to, to conclusions with other people's behavior. And sometimes we, we just don't know what's going on in their life. We don't know all the facts. Uh, there are some at that church that may not have understood Paul's motives uh, for doing the things that he did. They might have thought Paul was just being angry or that Paul was just being um, uh, hard-nosed about all this stuff. And, and uh, it wasn't that at all. And Paul wants to assure them that, for one, he was under a lot of stress. He was under a lot of trials himself. And he didn't want to add to that for them. He wanted them to straighten up, and he wanted them to listen to his words and be guided by the Spirit of God, and so that he could uh, he could be an encouragement to them in this way, and the, and they could be an encouragement to him. Now he says in verse six, sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. Now it's interesting he, he never names you know Paul knew people he. He knew names. He named, name all, named names all the time in his letters. But with this one, he didn't think it necessary to name the name. He thought it would be, they would know who he was talking about. Uh, so it wasn't necessary. And it's assumed that he's talking about the man who was involved in a, uh, a relationship with his father's wife. And uh, it's... The, 
it doesn't really say that, but it's assumed that that's so. And many scholars for many years have made that assumption. And I, I don't see any reason to differ with it myself. Uh, because the uh, Paul has told them to basically excommunicate him, to put him out of the church. And uh, which is something that's not, uh, that's not easily done because a lot of things, a lot of times when discipline in this way is implemented by a church, which is fairly unheard of today, but uh, for one thing, you have different circumstances. That back then, if you got put out of the church, you didn't have another church two blocks down the road to go to. <laughs> and here there's a church on every corner. And, and, and uh, so it, it was more meaningful for sure. But um, when that man was put out of the church, they followed Paul's instruction, they put him out of the church, but now Paul is going to give instruction concerning this situation. And he says uh, that his, so far he says his punishment was sufficient. So that contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. So he was the one that told them that you need to act on this situation. You need to let him know that this is not acceptable and it is not uh, going to be tolerated in the Lord's church. And that's what they did. They followed his instructions. But now Paul is saying, look, I heard this fellow straightened up. I heard he repented. Now it's time to back off. Now it's time to forgive him. And because you don't want him to be overcome with sorrow or swallowed up with it, uh, wherefore I beseech ye, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you whether you be obedient in all things. Uh, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave I it the person of Christ. Now, he goes on to say that, that, um, uh, that this is one of the reasons why he had correspondence coming back and forth was to let him know how they were handling this. And he says, you took appropriate action, but now it's time to forgive. And he says something interesting at that verse 11. And he says, lest Satan, and I messed up on my notes, I got 6 through 10, it should be 6 through 11. Uh, lest Satan should get an advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So he's telling them, look, I don't want you to continue to hold this against him, because he's, apparently he's repented. Uh, but he says that uh, it's necessary to forgive him. And Paul is saying, I'm not holding anything against him, so you shouldn't hold anything against him. And he says, lest Satan get an advantage of us. So it can it's fairly easily to deduce that one thing that unforgiveness does is give Satan an advantage over us. That's what unforgiveness does. And that's uh, uh, clear from what Paul said here. Now who wants that? Who on their right mind would want Satan to have an advantage over you? I would rather Satan have a disadvantage, to be quite honest. I would rather him not have an advantage in my life because I know he's not called the destroyer for no reason. He's called that because he wrecks your life. He wrecks people's lives and he wreaks havoc in your life. And I don't want that. But that's one of the things that unforgiveness does. It, it helps you. It does something for you. It takes away Satan's advantage over your life. So it's not for the other person so much. It is. But it isn't so much as it is for yourself. Um, the, so he wants them to, to do this so that you don't want Satan ha having an advantage over him because he says we're not ignorant of his devices. It's the trick of Satan to harbor ir ill will because it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't do anything good uh, uh, for the person, but it gives Satan an advantage in their life to make a wreck of it. Now in verse 12, I'm going to do this really quickly. Uh, in verse 12, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened uh, uh, unto me of the Lord. Now, he's still explaining why he hasn't come to them already again, and why he's sending this letter. 
He says, when he had came to Troas to preach the gospel, a door was opened unto him of the Lord. The Lord opened a, opened a way forward. He says, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother, but taking leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. So what this, what's happening here is Paul, as he just said, the reason for his correspondence, because he's wanted to keep up with them and find out how they're doing so he would know uh, 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 how to approach them the next time he came. Uh, he preferred to approach them in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in love and, and joy and comfort and peace. He preferred it. And so he wanted to get word back. He sent Titus while he was here. Go bring this letter to Corinth and, and, and then come back and report to me how things are going. Well, Paul is waiting on Titus to come but Titus doesn't show up. But in the meantime, God, and that's who Paul's working for, God opens a door for him. And it's, a, it's an opportunity for Paul to take. And it's happened a lot of times in Paul's life where Paul had a plan. This is the way things are supposed to go, and this is the way I want them to go. And I don't know about you, but when I make a plan, I hate more than anything to come off. It's when I make a plan, I don't care what's going on around me. Stick to the plan. And because that's just, seems like it works better that way than wiffle waffling back and forth and changing things up. Just keep it straight, keep it simple. But a lot of times, many times, our plans do not match God's plan. And there presents a problem. Paul encountered this many times. There was one time in the book of Acts. He thought to go east. There were lost people east. There were people that didn't know the gospel. There were people that were lost and going to hell that lived in the east that Paul could minister to. But the Holy Spirit said, no, go west. And then there was, uh, uh, while they were on that way, they were passing through an area where people were lost and didn't know the gospel and were going to hell. And the Holy Spirit told Paul, don't say anything to these people. Just keep right on going which is really bizarre when you think about it. But what had happened, there was a people that God was dealing with over in Macedonia. And that's when Paul had the dream later about the man in Macedonia that was saying, come here, come here. Well, the people there were ripe and ready for the gospel because God's spirit had gone ahead of them and had prepared the hearts of the people to receive it. And how he did that, I don't know, but that's what had happened. And so Paul's plan was to preach the gospel where, you know, in these other places, but the Holy Spirit told him, no, don't go there, don't go there. When we find out, well, God has something better here. So oftentimes we have to change our plan. And Paul, this one is no different. Paul's plan was to stay put until he heard word from Titus because he might want to go to Corinth. <clears throat> but he had a door of opportunity open for him for, to go somewhere else and do another thing. And it says it was with much uh, anguish uh, in, his, in, in his heart that he, uh, uh, there was no rest in his spirit because he didn't get to meet with Titus first. So he had to leave there not knowing how Titus was doing, not knowing how the church at Corinth was doing. And sometimes that's the way we have to live our life, by the way. We don't get to know everything. We don't get to know how everything is going. Sometimes we just have to go with where God is directing us. Sometimes we have to go where the opportunity is, where he's opened the door. And uh, trust him to handle all those uh, uncertainties, those things that we don't know. We just trust him. Paul has to trust him to take care of Titus. You have to trust God to take care of the church of Corinth while Paul goes and does the Lord's work somewhere else. And, um, but it works out well when you obey God. It works out well when you do what God says. Because God knows what he's doing. And his plan is the plan we need to be concerned about deviating from. Not our own plans. But, but Paul was uh, versatile in this instance. And he went with what God wanted. And uh, he goes on to say, Now thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. 
I want to stop right there for a second because Paul is using a picture, an example of something that they would have been very familiar with, especially in the days of Roman conquest. Um, but first of all, he says, thanks be to God. Now he's talking about all the things that, that uh, uh, had hindered him. And by the way, when I said about what Paul said to the Philippians, uh, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are good, and so forth, think on these things, it doesn't mean to stick your head in the sand and not be aware of what's going on around you. Um, it doesn't mean that at all. But find the list where it says, whatsoever things are going wrong, think on these things. Whatsoever things are hateful, whatsoever things are wicked, whatsoever things are evil, think on these things. Find a verse in Scripture that tells us this. You won't. And the reason why you won't is because we need no help doing this. We got that down pat. We can nitpick and pull out every complication and everything wrong with everything. I'm a pro. It takes, took me lots of practice, but I got pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to pull out the things that are good. My wife has to correct me all the time because I don't realize I'm complaining. I think I'm just coming, coming. <laughs> Making commentary. Yeah, that's what you're doing. Yeah, that's what you're doing too, too. Yeah, it, it's, a com it's a commentary in it. <laughs> we're just making comments. But no, we're complaining. We're complaining. We don't need help to think on those things. We obsess over those things. We need help to think on those things that are right, those things that are pure, those things that are good. But I, I don't, we don't do that, though. I'm not saying to ignore everything that's wrong, but to always view it in light of what's right. You know, uh, Paul is saying everything is wrong. I tried to contact you. I tried since I, Titus. I had to go before Titus came back. I don't know how you're doing. I don't know how Titus is doing, but I had to leave. But thanks be to God who always causes me to triumph. It doesn't sound like triumph, does it? But Paul is looking at everything, as he, as the scripture says, circumspectly. He's looking at everything in context of, of how, how things are. And the primary thing that we must not lose sight of is the fact that God is in control. Doesn't matter how things look, how bad they are. It doesn't matter if they're looking like they're falling completely <coughs> apart and we're doomed to failure. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph. Does he cause us to triumph most of the time? I think what it says, it says always. Is, is, is that reflected in your life as a Christian? Or do you always triumph? Well, think about what Paul is talking about. Look at the circumstances. Paul is talking about, he did mention things that were going wrong. But he says, I'm triumphing though in spite of that. In spite of the things that are going wrong, the things that are wrong are still there. But what he's saying is when he looks to Christ, he sees triumph. Because God is in control. And there's things going on that God's doing in his life that he doesn't even know about. That should be our attitude when trials come. It should be, Lord, what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to teach me? Because I'm not listening too well. And I'm not, I haven't got it yet. I'm confused. Yeah, that's the way our response should be. What, what are you trying to get me to understand? The, but he says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes, make it manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Well, let's go ahead and continue reading. Um, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. The one to the one, we, we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other, the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? I'll get to that in just a moment. But what comes ahead of that? The sweet savor, uh, the triumph. The Greek word that he uses for triumph there, uh, it describes a procession. A parade, if you will. A tri a, 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 what he's alluding to about the sweet savor on those that perish, as well as those that that that, uh, 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 that are saved. 
And, you know, it's hard to tell sometimes from history who has it right, uh, but because there are details that people differ on. But from the best of my knowledge, what's being communicated here is an example of what a, a, a triumphant parade for a conquering general would, would be. And that's what Paul is talking about. And what would happen is whenever there was a commanding uh, a, a, a general or, or, or such officer that uh, gained territory and conquered peoples for uh, the, uh, the empire, the, the, the Roman Empire, they would have for them a parade. And they would have a triumph, uh, is what it would be called, I suppose. But at any rate, the general would be paraded through the streets, and it was a big event that everybody from the city would come out to observe. And around the general would be his officers that was under him, and then the soldiers. And all of these men that were triumphant, uh, they would get to march with their general. And then behind would be those that were conquered. And they would be brought to be killed or executed for sport in the arena uh, to demonstrate their, their uh, uh, mastery over that people. And uh, uh, they, they could have been POWs, they could have been criminals, I don't know. Uh, what they were, but at the very least, there were some of them that was going to die. Now, they would have people coming through there with their incense and their smells. Now, I don't know what they would be doing, but we, what, the thing that came to my mind would be, uh, I don't know if y'all go to the fair in Beaumont, but I used to go to the fair when I was little, and I really liked it. I, I don't like it anymore because I don't like where they moved it, and I don't like they moved the time. Fall is the right time for the fair, not spring when it's burning up hot. Yeah. But anyways, <laughs> see, I'm not commenting. <laughs> Just commenting. <laughs> <Warm, warm. laughs> but uh, at any rate, when the, the thing that uh, you associate smells, and I can go by, you know, some place that's got a hot thing of grease, and and they're putting something good in it, uh, corn dogs or funnel cakes or, you know, you name it, like stuff they have at the fair. And then I immediately think, oh, the fair. You, you just associate that smell uh, with the event. And these parades were like that. There was a smell about them. Whatever they were burning, whether they were cooking things or whether they were burning incense, whether they would have the priest or whoever burning incense, I don't know. But at any rate, there was a smell associated with this celebration. And that smell to the victors would be the smell of life. It would be the smell of victory. But to the others, it would be the smell of death. Now, he's likening themselves as a participant in that parade. But the uh, smells that, that they're, you know, to the one group, to the soldiers, to the generals, to the officers, it would be a smell of victory. But to the others, it would be... Um, the smell of death, because that's what they had. That's what they had coming, and it wouldn't be wouldn't be pleasant. And the uh, the thing about always causing us to triumph, the uh, the mistake that we make is that we think that uh, Paul. Oh, excuse me. We, uh, we think that, that that God is supposed to be available to us to help us to triumph. But the thing we need to understand about the parade is the parade is not about uh, it's not about those, those soldiers or even about the officers. It's about the general. It's his parade. And Christ always causes us to triumph in that it's his triumph. Now, if I ask you, do you always triumph? You would say no. I would have to say no. Seldom ever do I triumph. Um, but uh, the reason why I don't triumph is because perhaps I'm expecting God to help me to triumph over those things that, uh, that uh, plague me or that worry me instead of trusting in Him. Because when you, when you think of your inadequacies and when you think of your uh, hang-ups and your problems, if you're honest, 
they are a lot of them and they're big and they're uh, things that we have very little power or control over and many times uh, whatever our advice is uh, uh, many times we might try to overcome it we might try to triumph over it but we find that we fall even flatter than we did before and we wonder why 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 can't i get through this why can't i get over this why can't why does this thing keep uh, uh, mastering over me? And our lives are far cry from always triumphing in reality. But what has happened is all of all those inadequacies, when we think about Jesus, now what inadequacy did he possess? What thing did he possess? What vice did he have that overcame him? It was none. There was nothing that he couldn't do. There was no uh, obstacle that was too great. Uh, now, he went to the cross, and it wasn't necessarily a, 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 it wasn't a fun thing by any stretch. It wasn't a, a good thing. Only in the, for him and, and for uh, 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 his uh, personal being, it was good for him because it's what he wanted to do to redeem us. Uh, and, and in that respect, it was good for us. But it certainly wasn't a pleasant experience, I guess I'm trying to say. But yet he triumphed over it. There was death itself couldn't even keep a hold of Christ. There is no enemy. There is no problem. There is no conflict that is too great for Christ. There is no situation that exists where Christ is defeated. There is no situation that is greater, that has greater strength or greater power than him. So if we are in him and he in us, and you're, you're, the idea is to participate in his triumph. You participate in his parade. And uh, he's also comparing you to that aroma. That your presence there is like that aroma. It's the aroma of death to those that are perishing but the aroma of life for those that are saved. And uh, the, uh, but the mistake that we've made is when we look to God to strengthen us, uh, to enable us to have victory, to enable us to have triumph over our trials and over our difficulties, when in reality, we're supposed to lean on Him. We're supposed to walk in His parade. We're wanting God to throw a parade for us. When we need to be in his parade, we need to be walking with him in his triumph and celebrating his triumph. Amen. And you know, there's no inadequacies, and there's no inadequacies that you possess that he is not capable of overcoming. He's overcome them all. So when we uh, find ourselves in those situations, that's the only, uh, the only remedy, the only way that we have out is to trust in Christ. I'm not big enough for this. I'm not strong enough for this. I am a, 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 there's, there's no way I can overcome uh, this thing or whatever it is. But you know Christ is. So I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust him to take care of this problem for me. And I'm going to leave it with him. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to fret over it. It's his. And he's capable of taking care of it. And if he, don't, if he doesn't take care of it right away, I'm going to trust him anyway. Paul's experience is not everything falling in place like he wanted. Paul's experience was rarely that. But Paul is able to say, thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph. Because we might not see it, we might not understand it, but it's his triumph. And if we're willing to trust him, if we're willing to, uh, that's the reason why I have that question mark there. Because it doesn't seem like reality in most of our lives. It doesn't seem like that in my life many times, that I always triumph. No, I tend to fail a lot and instead of triumph. But it doesn't have to be that way. The only reason I fail is I'm expecting Christ to strengthen this flesh, and this flesh has no power and has no, no place in our life to, to have victory over anything like that. But Christ does. And so as we trust in Him, he indeed causes us always to triumph. And we can say, thanks be to God, even when things are not going our way. 
He says, uh, who is sufficient for these things? What does he mean by that? Uh, who is sufficient for what things? Who is sufficient for this parade? Who is sufficient for uh, uh, this triumph? It's not us. He said, I'm going to skip forward. Uh, he says in verse 5 of the next chapter, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. That's who is sufficient for these things. It's God. He's the only one that is sufficient for our trials, for our tribulations, and as well for our trial. God is the only one that has a place in all that. We can share in that with him, but we can't do it while we're standing over here away from him, apart from him. We have to get with him in trust and walk with that procession with him and participate in his victory, in his triumph. And no matter how bad things get, we can always elevate Christ and say, look here, my life might be a wreck, but there's one right here who's in control of it all. And at the end of the day, he's going to make it right. Amen. And he's going to see to it. I don't have to do it. He is. And boy, will he. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. He's saying that I'm not telling you this thing in a corruption of God's word. I'm, I'm telling you this in complete and utter sincerity. Isn't it fascinating, though, that even in Paul's day, there were people that were preaching the word uh, for gain? You would think that the, the, uh, the, the, the televangelist would be something new and the hucksters and the charlatans out there. We, we would think that would be a, a recent development, but it's not. They were all the way back in the first century. So there might have been those that might have thought Paul was of that vein whenever he said he would show up and he didn't show up. But things don't always work out the way we want them. But we are always going to triumph in the end of it all. And we can be confident in that. And that's, that too can give us peace in the time of trial or tribulation. Is knowing that, that Christ is triumphant and that we can share in his triumph. Let's stop right there as we go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this time together. And we do thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray that you would help us to, to trust in your strength. Trust in the triumph, Lord, that you have triumphed with. And help us, O Lord, to not look to the strength of this flesh. Help us not to look inward to everything that's wrong. But help us, Lord, to look outward to everything that you've done. Because that's what is right. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be a blessing and encouragement to those around us with such knowledge. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. Is there any comments or questions, anything we'd like to share before we dismiss?